right? The, the ways I've grown most in my life haven't come through good happening to me or answered prayer. It's come through the hard times. It's come through the silence from God. It's come through the waiting that my trust in him has has grown, that my faith has matured. And this seems to be uh, the pattern that we see in, in other Christians of the past. Um, Peter mentions this in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. He says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, he says there's a purpose to the various trials that go on because it tests the genuineness of our faith, which is more important than riches. Paul, he talks about this as well, Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that's to be revealed in us, right? We will suffer now. But what's to come in the future far outweighs the hardships we go through here. Paul also says in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 10, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we'd received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. See, suffering strengthens us, pushes us to rely on God in new ways. And this idea of seeking out the miraculous, right? We're instructed to pray for people who are sick, right? To take them before the elders, to cast all of our cares on the Lord because he cares for us, to, to be thankful and content with the life he's given us. So there's nothing wrong with, with asking God for healings and, and for help and for uh, friends and family to come to know the Lord and, and for everyday needs. N nothing wrong with that. We're instructed to pray for those things. But this idea of we should be seeing as many miracles as the book of Acts shows the early disciples saw, I don't know if that's true. And if it was, what would it do? What would the purpose be? You see, as I read scripture, it seems that the purpose of miracles is primarily to validate the message of God. If, if you were God, how would you get people's attention? What's the type of thing that you would do to draw attention to what you want to communicate? Well, it would have to be something miraculous. It'd have to be something extremely out of the ordinary that would wake people up to say, hey, I need to pay attention to this. Miracles are used to validate God's messengers and his message. And we see this happen um, in, in Moses' life, in Elijah's life, in Jesus' life. The, those three characters in Scripture, those three people from the past, it seems that miracles really cluster a lot around their three ministries. Now, sometimes we see miracles outside of them, but, but those are kind of the three primary places we see miracles occurring uh, throughout Scripture. And it's, it's those three people, those three men who, who were extremely important messengers for God. Now, God validated Christ's message ultimately through the resurrection, right? He predicted he would rise from the dead, and then he did rise from the dead. And he said, this is the sign. This is the sign for all generations, the sign of Jonah that validates my message as being true. And so if the purpose of miracles is to validate God's message, to draw attention to God's messengers so we can know what is from God, not just blindly trust, but have some type of evidence for it. If that is the purpose, then I, I've thought about, well, as a Christian, I have believed in the message of Jesus. I have trusted in the resurrection. It's, it's drawn my attention, and I have accepted it to be true. So if the point is to draw attention to the message, my attention's been drawn. Now, how does God primarily disciple and grow people who've already trusted in the message of Jesus? That, that's the next question. And I think it's through suffering, not through the miraculous. Um, James, Jesus' brother, talks about this, right? Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you go through various suffering and trials because you know it's purifying your faith. 
suffering needs to be embraced. And and this is a danger that I'm seeing in um, in certain circles of evangelical Christianity, is that we get so focused on praying for the miracle, wanting the miracle, believing for a miracle. And if that healing happens, if that miracle occurs, what it's doing is it's alleviating suffering. And that's what, that's what we pray for. We're praying for the alleviation of a hardship. But maybe it's the hardship that God is going to use to grow us, to mature us, to purify us, and not the release from it. Greg always says on this show, you know, that, that uh, the psalmist didn't say, I get a helicopter ride over the valley of the shadow of death, right? But as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me, right? He's with us through the hardships, and he doesn't always alleviate it. And so I've thought about expecting or wanting alleviation all the time maybe would stunt my growth as a Christian. And, and I don't want to ask for suffering. I don't want to pray, Lord, bring more suffering into my life. But it's an interesting thing of what's God's primary way of growing us.